All right, it says here that um, the function of the red head in Agama lizard is to counsel and camouflage the animals from predators, scare other males from the territory, attract females for mating purpose. And that is the answer. C is the answer. It's the, the, the aim of this um, red head actually is to, that red part is to um attract female really and there's this thing here called gula fold which is not really um prominent in this picture that one source of during anger when they actually want to fight that's when that comes up there during when it is trying to claim its territory that's when all of that comes up and it starts fighting with detail but this color of the redhead actually is to attract the female during for mating purposes right now seed plants are divided into two a tracheophyte and ferns angiosperms and and um, gymnosperm that will be the answer now let me say this tracheophyte simply means um plants that are vascular which includes these these and these however um, the that does not talk about whether it is seed or not. Ferns are not seed plants, really. So that's why the answer is B, right? Uh, Monocot and dicot are actually subset of of um, angiosperms, really, and um, talophyte and bryophyte. Well, those are no, um, they are not even vascular plants in the first place. Let alone being a um, seed plant. So this is what angiosperms looks like: seeds that have a fruit around them covering them so the, the seeds are not naked while for gymnosperm the seed are actually naked one major thing that differentiates gymnosperm from angiosperm is the fact that the seed of angiosperms are actually enclosed really while that of gymnosperms are open and are, are, are on a structure called um, cone so to say all right once again the answer to this is b which is angiosperms and gymnosperms all right now it says here in which in which of the following groups of vertebrates is parental care mostly exhibited now let me just go straight here now these two apes and mammals are the ones that do that all right but the one that does it all the way like i mean like almost all of the category does it is the mammals all right so when it says mostly that's why i underline the word mostly they are the ones that actually do that like all the way like almost all mammals i'm not sure there's any mammal that doesn't um exhibit parental care for the birds i'm not sure if it's all of them that does that but this the answer to this d all right and it says adaptive importance of nuptial flight from termite colonies is to the first word you need to remember is what's the meaning of nuptial nuptial simply means like wedding something something of sort like wedding like coming together now this is done by termites they, they actually it's not really a serious wedding so to say but it looks somewhat like this now when the termiterium or where they stay is um um filled up what they do is they actually have to start um some of them will develop wings because ordinarily termites don't normally have wings so they will not develop wings they, we call them reproductive wings reproductive now what they will do is they actually fly out of the termiterium like this and they will fill the whole place where well, some will be eaten, some will escape. Now, from each of those we've seen, some are males, some are females. So they will actually get wedded, so to say. It's like they will go up there, meet there, and come down. If you're probably observant, you might have seen sometimes after the during like when the raining season just starting, what happens is when this happens, when this winter fly happens, so when you see something of such like this. It means no shaft flight. So next time you see that, that's what it is. And what are they doing actually? When they, they've flown up there, they come down after some time. And you probably see like two of them falling to like one, like that. I've seen that severely since I was, a, I've been a child, really. I've been seeing that severely. So you will, 
the, the aim of that is to um, go and start each of those two are potential queen and king. They are the ones to start up a new time material. Reason being that that colony where they are, let's say this colony here, is overly filled. And if they stay there, the, the resources will not be enough to cater for everybody there. So they have to go and set up. So I think with that explanation, you should be able to know what the answer is here. It says, disperse reproductive in order to establish new colonies. That made sense. Let's see the other ones. Rabbit and food for birds and animals, no. Ensure crossbreeding between members of the colony and another species, no. Expect reproductive so as to provide enough food for all the members. Now, this deal made sense, but it's not just to provide food for other members, but to establish new colonies. So, A is the answer, all right? All right. I already told you, it says to expel the colonies, well, as to provide enough food, yes, to provide enough food, yes. But not just to provide enough food for the many people there, but to actually establish, like, to disperse their population. Their size, A. All right. Then it says here, an example of an endospermous um, seed is, uh, normally it seed has either cotyledon or endosperm, really. And the endosperm or cotyledo is a part of the seed that provides some um, food for the seed to germinate. Let me say this. For a seed to germinate, it needs to respire. And during respiration or after respiration, energy is produced for the germination, plumal to be formed, radical to be formed, and all of those things. So that food is stored up in either cotyledon or endosperm. Now, the cotyledon is found in dicots. Dicots are the ones that produces cotyledon. Cotyledon. Well, endosperm is produced by monocot, which example here will be your maze. And that's the reason why that's the answer. So let me show you what that means. So all of these parts here are the words at the endosperm that provides food for the developing embryo. So this is the embryo here. So as the food is, um, sorry, as the, yes, as this endosperm is being broken down by respiration to release, release energy, that's what the embryo uses to develop plumule and radical like that. So this is gonna be like plumule is gonna be radical. Now, that's why I've often told my student that it is impossible for you just to extract this embryo and grow it. It won't grow because there's nothing to provide energy for it. So this endosperm, which is the one that contains food for the seed to grow, for the embryo to grow, really. All right. So once again, the answer is A. Now, it says, which of the following can cause shrinkage of cells? All right. When you put the cell in different type of solutions. If, let's say this is the cell, like mm -hmm. that, and this is the solution surrounding the cell. So this is the cell with the seed there. If the solution is stronger than what the cell has inside, like the, than the internal environment of the cell, what happened is, so a, a stronger solution is called concentrated solution, or you say hypertonic solution. All right, so what happened is, the uh, fluid with the water within the cell is sucked out so we call that exosmosis but if this the solution is actually diluted surrounding the cell we call that hypotonic or diluted solution in that case the cell will rather suck in that fluid or the water in that fluid we call that endosmosis now from what i've said now let me show you this and probably you need to pick your answer from there now, I just did this for you to probably understand first before picking the answer. Now, this is hypertonic solution. This is isotonic, which means the concentration within the cell and after the cell is equally the same. So the fluid just moves in and out and stabilizes or doesn't even move at all. Now, hypotonic solution here, the surrounding fluid is actually more, sorry, less um, concentrated or diluted or hypotonic. So from what you can see here, when we place the animal cell inside the plant cell, so inside an hypotonic solution, you can see it shrinks, like it shrinks, it shrinks. 
So that is um, that process is called called creation. Creation process whereby a cell shrinks in a hypotonic solution. The answer to this question is A. There. Now the question, the reason why this entire cell does not shrink in plant cells because there is an external cell wall which is rigid. It is only the cell membrane and the cytoplasm you can see that that um, shrink. That is called plasmolysis, or plas the cell becomes plasmolysed, so to say. All right. But if it is put in an hypotonic solution, that cell will suck in water, and the what become expanded, torgid. That's what you have here. It becomes torgid. That's what you have down here. Torgid. All right. Well, in the case of animal cell like blood here if it keeps sucking the water it's going to end up rupturing like you have at this corner here that one is rupturing let me show you that more like, yeah this is rupturing and we call that hemolysis because it is red blood cell that's actually rupturing that's why we call it hemolysis but whether red blood cell or any other um, cell if animal cell if it keeps sucking in the hypotonic solution and you don't remove it a time comes whereby it becomes torgid and it's gonna burst but the plant cell won't burst really because of this hard cellulose or let me say rigid cellulose that prevent it really all right so you might pause the video or rewind it to see this more once again the answer is um why say hypotonic solution that was a mistake please hypotonic solution please hypotonic solution that was a mistake really i mean hypotonic this when you put a cell in a a cell will shrink when it's put in hypertonic solution. That was a very um, a big mistake from my end. I actually didn't see this hypotonic really, but thank God we actually went back there to see that D is the answer. Even from my explanation, well, you can actually know that that was a mistake from my end. Now it says here, which of the following is true of leukocytes? All right. Now, leukocytes are basically white blood cells, really. The BBC, which means white blood cells. Now, they are respiratory pigments. You know, those are actually um, hemoglobin red blood cells. They are most numerous, numerous and ramify all cells. Now, if you say they are most numerous, that's wrong because they are not so much as... Um, um, red blood cell. Red blood cell actually has the highest number anyway. So ramify is like they have branches. Well, that's not really true anyways. They are large and nucleated. That is our answer. Yes, they are actually large. Uh, it says this is they're involved in blood clots. So, well, that's not so. It is thrombocyte that does that. So here they are. You can see them. These are the categories of, red, uh, of white blood cells. Now, please let me quickly say some few things here. These ones called, I'm going to mark them with like this N E B. You probably notice that they have granules. You can see they have granules, whether big or small, there. So those ones are actually called granulocytes. So we say N E B, which is neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, are called granulocytes. Granulocytes, which means cells that have granules in them so the sites always also granules in cells then why we have the lymphocytes and the monocyte as the a granulocyte a granulocyte now it is possible you probably have heard somebody calling some group of white blood cells phagocytes phagocytes the phagocyte simply means a cell capable of engulfing like this is something a foreign body and they can actually engulf it like that now the ones that can do that is actually monocytes let me put a p there phagocyte and also neutrophils so these two these two are referred to as phagocytes so you probably notice that it's picked one example from monocyte and sorry from a granulocyte and it picks one example from granulocyte. So these phagocytes as a group of white blood cells is based on functions such as ability to what engulf 
the cell or to engulf another cell, so to say. So it's, it, it's a category of but the real category is actually granulocyte and the granulocyte. But this one is like functional category. Then also lymphocyte is the one that is responsible for the production of our antibodies. All right. Or some people call it antibodies. Either, either way, that is what really helps us, what really protects us against diseases. These other ones does that too. But they do it in a different way. But this one, lymphocyte, produces antibodies, which is our real immune system, so to say. All right. Now, it says here, the conversion of a nutrient into a molecule in the body of a consumer is referred to as conversion of nutrient to a molecule. Well, that should be digestion, yes. Digestion is the breaking down of complex big molecules into, or let me say, big subs, food substance into um, a simpler molecule which the body can actually absorb. So if, if you say, it says conversion, all right. Absorption is actually when it has been broken into simple molecules and is then going into a bloodstream, while assimilation is processed whereby a cell is making use of what has been absorbed. I take that again. Digestion is we have those big chunks of food broken down into simpler ones like that. Then absorption is these simpler molecules being absorbed into the cell. All right, so let's assume this rectangular structure is a cell there. Now, assimilation means ability for this cell to use it to do its function. Let's assume this cell is a muscle cell which contracts and relaxes. So assimilation will be that ability of this cell to use this food, the nutrient it has absorbed towards to contract and to relax. All right, those are the different stages of um, 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 heterotrophic nutrition anyways, all right? Or let me say nutrition in heterotrophs, all right? So moving on. The ability to, of living organism to detect and respond to changes in the environment is referred to as, um, if you can actually remember the characteristics of living things, which is summarized into M R. N I G E R D A C. The M means movement. The this first arrow can means um, respiration and nutrition. I irritability, which is the ability of a living thing to respond to stimuli. So the answer to this is B. Now G means growth. E means excretion. R means respiration. Now, E, the first one was reproduction. I also means reproduction. The second one, first one was respiration. It doesn't really matter. I mean, either of these R can be respiration or reproduction. Then D means death. A means adaptation. Then C means competition. So this is characteristics which makes a living thing. An ability to respond to stimulus means, for example, now you tapped, my eyes is closed and you tapped me. I know where you tapped me. Or, or someone was going to put the eyes, some his fingers into your eyes accidentally and you respond. That's respiration. Every living thing resp uh, responds. So, I mean, that's irritability. I beg your pardon. That's irritability, all right? Or ability to respond to light, like the the pupil dilating and cont um, constricting. So, pupillary constriction or dilation, either of those is actually irritability in itself, all right? So, moving on. And it says here, in mammals, the exchange of nutrients and metabolic products occurs in the, okay, exchange of metabolic products and nutrients. Nutrients, well, nutrients are never exchanged in, in, the, in the lungs, no. We will have a gaseous exchange there, which CO2 could be a product of metabolism anyways, but nutrients, so A is off. Osphagos, no. Trachea, no. We are left with D, which is lymph. Now, let me quickly say this quickly. Now, this, this is a cell here. These are cells. Let me just put these as cells, really. And um, actually, I should have actually gotten a diagram for this book. And I always explain what I'm trying to do that I'm going to explain to you now in a minute. Okay. 
Okay, so this is um, a capillary. Oh, I'm just doing this a capillary. This is um, artery. This is um, vein. And um, this is vein. And this is capillary. So what happened is the, the nutrients, I mean, um, for example, oxygen is released into the tissue. I can that it comes from the tissue into the blood. Also, glucose goes into the tissue and other nutrients. Now, while this is happening, into this space, all right, um, some fluids will leak into the space. And those fluid that leaks is actually called lymph. Now, there's something I want you to know at this point. This lymph, all right, contains like all sorts of nutrients and some waste because why the exchange is going on between the tissue and the capillary, some fluid leaks here. So those fluid contains nutrients and um, some waste products. Some, some of the nutrients majorly is actually going to be fat. Now, this lymph then will be carried by another structure, some other vessel which I'm drawing there, which we call lymphatic vessel. And that lymphatic vessel will find a way to go and add this leaked fluid back to the blood. Now, lymphatic system, which contains lymphatic vessel, helps really in doing a lot of things. But lymphatic vessel in this regard will help to transport the, the waste which, is, which leaks there and the fat and some other things. But fat is one of the products that has been transported. All right, so from analysis, A to C, cannot be the one carrying nutrients and metabolic products. It doesn't work that way. So the answer is D. And um, if you're probably seeing my video on, the, um, on transport system in animals, this will make it easier for you to understand. All right, so moving on. So you can always rewind the video to probably hear the explanation again. In mammals, the exchange of nutrients and metabolic products occurs in the limb. There must have been a repetition. Sorry about that. I already explained that just now. Then it says here, parasitism to sundew, autotrophism to amoeba, saprophytism to alga, heterotrophism to agama lizard. All right, it says which of the fall, which of the above modes of nutrition is correctly matched with the organism that exhibits? Well, basically, that will be. Um, sundew is a carnivorous plant which is under um, heterotrophism, like heterotrophs. Autotrophism means organisms that can make their food by themselves. Amoeba cannot, they are heterotrophs. Saprophytism means organisms that cause things to decay and they obtain food while that thing is decaying. And alga actually are photosynthetic, which means they are autotrophs. So that's wrong. So heterotrophs means organisms that feed on other organisms. So a gamma lizard is that. So the answer to that is going to be four, which is C, because a gamma lizard feeds on cockroaches, feeds on insects and all of those. So it's actually carnivores. So maybe sometimes feed on some seeds to some extent. All right. So the answer is C to that. Now, using the following information to answer the question below, it says test tube containing cane sugar then test tube containing cane sugar and diluted acid. And three says test tube containing cane sugar and its dehydrating degrading enzyme. In which of the test tube will glucose be detected after completing after complete hydrolysis? All right, the first thing we need to know is that the cane sugar, as it were, contains a type of sugar called sucrose sucrose which is a disaccharide because it has two um, simple sugar in it and two monosaccharide in it now this sucrose is a non-reducing sugar which means if you um just test for a reducing sugar which is going to be glucose galactose and not any of those monosaccharide it will not work really so what can happen is anytime you're having sucrose in a solution, let's say this is a test tube that contains sucrose, the first thing you're meant to do is to first add HCl 
all right, not conquer anyways, to do what? To dissolve the two monosaccharides held together in that structure because sucrose is disaccharide. So what HCl will do is break this bond. So when it breaks this bond, that's the first thing, then you now have something like this in the test tube now. The two bonds are separated, all right? The two monosaccharides are actually separated. Then what happens is you now add probably any kind of enzyme you want to add if you're adding enzyme or you um uh um or or or, or you just um uh, or you you're going to add a, a, a solution let's say benedict solution to test for um reducing sugar so from what we've said now test is containing containing um, sugar and water the second one says test of containing cane sugar and diluted solution test of containing cane sugar and it's um um, degrading enzyme. Well, the question, the, the answer is going to be D, like all of them, containing cane sugar and water. Then, oh, sorry, it's going to be two and three. Test of containing cane sugar and a little HCl, all right. Then, test of containing its degrading enzyme. Let me read that again. Which of the test tube will glucose be detected? Yes, it is because here you're going to test for this glucose. Yes. So, so it's, it's going to work this way. So it's going to be B. So this is like two. We have degraded it. We have broken the bonds by using HCl. Then now we now add Benedict solution. All right. That is the three. That, that's what's happening. It says degrading enzyme or, some, or degrading. Uh, okay, sorry. Let, let me just leave it there. I was actually thinking of something else already. So the answer is B. Please rewatch, rewind the video if it seems a bit confusing to you. All right, I don't want to keep on this for so long. All right. So here you are. You can actually pause the video here. I, I deliberately added some of these things to help you. The things I've explained is actually here. This is what I explained here, here, this one around here. That's what I explained. So you might as well just um, um, rewind the video here and that makes it easier for you to understand what um, is happening really. All right. And these are other type of sugars here. You can see the monosaccharide and disaccharide, all right. Moving on, in says, using the formation to answer the question below, test of containing cane sugar and water, test of containing cane sugar and delta HCL, the same formation we had earlier on, test of containing cane sugar and its degrading enzyme. Well, the enzyme involved is the, the enzyme involved in hydrolysis is going to be sucrase. Now, if you are actually using enzyme, I know you, what we had from the question fourteen was like we're trying to test for sugar, test for glucose. And that's why we had to first break the bonds by using hydrochloric acid. But this one, we don't need to do that. So what we need to do is we actually want to degrade it. The, the sucre, sucrose, which is in cane sugar, and that can be done by sucrase. So sucrase is the one that's going to break down sucrose. All right. Then the part of the mammalian ear responsible for, re, for maintenance of balance is, well, let me put it this way. Uh, the cochlea is actually the site of um, hearing. So that is wrong. Pina is just outside here which is part, part of the um, external ear. What does it do? It just helps to collect sound waves. Perilymph is actually a fluid which should be found in cochlea or other parts. And that other part is the vestibular system. So there's something called vestibular apparatus that contains the semicircular canal. So the answer to our question here is D. So this is your external ear from here to here. It's the external ear. It contains the pinna, the ear, auditory, um, Miatus, so or we say um, ear canal, then the eardrum, those are the three things that forms the external ear. Then just these three bones forms the middle ear, that's the um, malleus, incus, and stapes. M I S, mis, malleus, incus, and stapes, or you want to use the English version, which means hammer, anvil, and stirrup. Those are the three. So H A S, is that you say? I, I use that acronym to remember like the arrangement of the 
year ossicles. Those are the smallest bones in the human body, anyways. So year ossicles from the um he eardrum, otherwise called tympanic membrane. Another name for eardrum is tympanic membrane. So from the eardrum to the oval window in the inner ear. So this is the inner ear here. So this is outer ear, middle ear, inner ear. So this arrangement from this ear cycle from the outer ear to the inner ear is the this hammer anvil stirrup or malleus incus or steps is the same thing we miss them. It's just another name the bear so to say so this inner ear is one that contains your semicircular canal so this is semicircular canal semicircular canal all right then this is the um cochlea which is the site of um hearing so this semicircular canal forms part of the vestibular system which is what we use for balance so this is the area we use for balance really this area we use for balance if you have seen my lecture on sense organ probably this will make more sense to you so this one helps us to maintain balance whether on a straight line or when we um are sideways either way um, what's called transverse or um, linear kind of balance so vestibular system is the one responsible for balance people actually used to think is the pain i know it's actually inside, inside, inside. All right, moving on. Then the path followed by air as it passes through the lungs in mammals is, um, okay, the right thing is going to be, the first one actually is going to be, um, come in, trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, and alveoli. That's like how smaller it's becoming. Like when you breathe in from your mouth, it goes to your larynx. So larynx to trachea, trachea to bronchi, bronchi to bronchioles, so bronchio to alveoli, which is the actual site of gaseous exchange. I think I have something here to show us that, yes, good. So this is what we're saying. So it's like, if I was going to label this, I can say this is going to be like one, two, three oh sorry it's going to be one two three bronchus comes from bronchioles four bronchus is similar of bronchi anyways so this is four then you have your alveoli so you can see this this whole structure is alveolo singular so this is going to be like the fifth one so that's why a is the correct answer when you're breathing in like that what the question says how would the air pass out so it's going to be the reverse. It's going to be like alveoli to bronchioles, bronchioles to bronchi, bronchi to trachea, then to the larynx, then out of our body as it were through the nose. Now the movement, right? The movement response of a cockroach away from a source of light can be described as. Now number one is movement of animals response to things are called taxism, taxism or taxic. Taxis, so it's a tactic movement. Now, so this taxism, if you are moving towards, whether taxism, any of the responses we have to, uh, uh, towards living, to, towards stimulus, if you are responding, to moving towards that stimulus, let's say this is light here, you are moving towards the light, we call that positive taxism, all right? And if you are moving away from it, we call it negative. Either it doesn't apply to taxism alone, whether it is um, tropic movement or tactic movement like we have here. So the answer here, because it's moving away from light, is called um, negative phototaxism. So the B is the answer. It's negative because it's moving away from the stimulus. So if it was moving towards it, we call it positive. Bear in mind that this taxism is really different types. So it's a photo. So it was like we have chemotaxism, which means based on um, chemicals. So we have different types of these, right? So the answer is B. So this is what we have here. These are insects moving towards light. So this one is going to be what? Positive because they are moving towards the light bulb there. All right, moving on. So it says here, the vascular tissue in higher plants are responsible for what? Vascular tissue majorly means your xylem and your phlegm all right so xylem and phlegm are the ones that does 
the transporting of substances and they transport food and water. Which one transport the food? Dark xylem, sorry, phlegm, I mean to say. Phlegm transport the manufactured food, where xylem transport, transports minerals and water. So it's going to transport dissolved minerals and water from the soil. So this is what we have here. So this is the this is phlegm. This is phlegm or phlegm. Some people call it, and it's called xylem. So xylem is the one transporting water and mineral salt. While this you can see transport of sucrose by a process called translocation, so to say. And this is companion cells. This is your sieve tube, the sieve plate, and all of those things. Never mind about this for the moment, but the point is this is your xylem transporting water and mineral salt from the soil, dissolved mineral salt, and this is your phlegm transporting um, food, which is in form of sucrose. Be, pay attention here that when you, at the end of photosynthesis, what you form is glucose. However, the plant will only really transport the sugar in form of sucrose, which is like you have two glucose molecules. I think this is um, done by nature so that you don't have to go forth and back. It's going to be faster. Imagine you are transporting glucose singly like that. But to make it faster, it transports it in two, which is called sucrose. So, so you hear this, that um, sucrose, sorry, sugar is transported in the form of sucrose in the plant's body. People are probably imagine it is just transported as glucose. No, it is formed as glucose at the end of photosynthesis, but it is transported as sucrose and stored as starch. That's the point to remember. Formed as glucose, transported as sucrose, and stored as starch. All right, moving on. Now, which of the following organs regulate the levels of water, salt, hydrogen, ions, and urea in the mammalian body? Regulate amounts of it. That would be the kidney. That's why I actually put that there. So the kidney, which forms part of the urinary system, or some would say excretory system. Fine. All right. Now, the sequence of the one-way gaseous exchange mechanism in fish will be, let this diagram help us do that. So it's going to be from the mouth. So when, once the water enters the mouth like that, then it goes over the gills. But while going over the gills, something happens. The oxygen in the water is taken into the gills, and the carbon dioxide in the body of the fish will come out of the gills like that into the water. So it's going to be, um, and it's going to go out through this structure called operculum. Opercular cover, some will call it, so this is what, well, operculum is present in fishes like these, are bony fish, but for um, cartilaginous fish, what they have is called gill slit. Gill slit. It performs the same function. It also co co covers their um, gills, so to say. So, they do, it doesn't open the way this one opens in the bony fish, but it's the same thing. So, it's going to be um, mouth to gill, then to upper column. So it's gonna be D. So it goes in through the mouth, goes over the gills, over, after the gills, it moves out of the upper column. All right, hope that made sense. But don't forget that upper column is the same, you know, has the same function as gill slit. Just like gill slit is found in cartilaginous fishes, all right, fish that have cartilages, while uh, those ones that have upper column are majorly um, bony fishes. Now, the type of reproduction that is common to both paramecium and other protists, because paramecium is a type of protist anyway, will be fission. Fission, which means like one organism splitting into two. Now, bear in mind, there could be just two like this, which is called binary fission. Or, in, in the case whereby you have one particular one dividing to form a lot of small ones. And they normally use this second, this, um, this one is called multiple fission. Multiple, like it's going to form multiple versions. They use this when there is, um, the weather condition is not very suitable, probably it's not suitable for um, sexual reproduction or it's not suitable for binary fission. They actually want to just 
seize the opportunity and form a lot of their other copies. So at this point, I, mean, I don't know if you're able to see that. This is really um, preventing me from, well, I don't know if you're able to see that one there. It says, one says it refers to the duration of parent cell into two small, nearly equal size, identical daughter individuals. That's what is there. And number two says the parent cell does not break away. Wow, I don't know why this is actually obstructing that really. I tried to remove it earlier on. Okay, no problem. Moving on. So just this, this two is to help you um, see the differences between multiple fusion and binary fusion. So you can see the example here is amoeba, is, example here is amoeba, example here is paramecium. So, well, they are both protists. So moving on, in nature, plants and animals are perpetually engaged in mutualism because mutualism means both organisms are benefiting. How are plants benefiting from us? How are we benefiting from them? Well, we exchange gases majorly. So he says they utilize the respiratory waste of each other. Yes, because um, plants take in carbon dioxide, which is a waste product of respiration from us at that point, and we take in oxygen, which is a waste product of photosynthesis that's why we exhibit some sort of it's a cycle they release carbon dioxide sorry, oxygen and we take that in for respiration to bring that respiration to to produce energy and when we are done producing energy we release a waste product called carbon dioxide which is taken in by plants really but bear in mind that plants also will use that oxygen much later in the at night all right so moving on now this one it says in an experiment the percentage of humus and water in the soil sample, the following results were obtained. So weight of the evaporating basin alone. All right. Well, this is, um, you should probably understand some part of agricultural science or um, ecolo uh, basic ecological concept. It's going to help you. So weight of basin and soil. So you can see that this is the weight of the dish alone plus the soil. And so that's why it becomes small. Now, after drying the soil in an oven, apparently it's going to remove, reduce because water has evaporated out of it. Then wait. And so after you have dried it, that means there's no steam coming out from the soil anymore. That means there's no water in it. Then if you continue to put the soil in the oven, what happens is you start seeing smoke coming out. If smoke is coming out, that means that... Um, the humus in the soil is already burning. So you can see there's a reduction from 99 grams to 90, sorry. Yes, to 95, of course, because 99 is more than 95. That means some, some, the water is out of it, the humus is out of it. So we have to calculate the percentage of humus in the soil. So let's do some analysis. So you need to know that your gram, the weight of your soil, of the evaporating dish, Pause the video here and try to attempt these things. Well, before I, I'm going to give you the parameters anyways. So that is going to be your M1 as mass of the basin alone. M1, M2 is going to be your basin and the soil. M3 is going to be your soil and the, in the oven after it has been dry. Then your M4 is going to be your weight of the basin and, basin and the um, soil. Now, what you need to know is how do you get the mass of fresh soil without the basin? That's going to be M2 minus M3. How do you get the mass of the humus alone? Without the basin, it's going to be M4. Sorry, M3 minus M4. You have that there. So how do we calculate the percentage? So, so of course, when you point your calculator, it's going to be 21. How do I do that? I, it's going to be you minus... Oh, I don't want to go there yet. What you did was you minus um, uh, 101.5 minus... Um, 80.5 that's what gives you 21 and for the humus you minus um, 99 99 gram minus 95.5 that's what gives us 3.5 basically all right so how do you calculate it so to calculate the percentage humus is going to be the mass of the um, humus which is these how do i know that that's what we did here then mass of the fresh soil. How do I know that? That's what we did here. Times 100, 
when you input your values you're going to get 16.66 which is can be approximated as 16.7 that's what you have here all right hope that made sense you can pause the video rewind it here try to attempt the calculation it's going to be fine now an example of a filter feeder animal is when it's a filter feeder which means they strain out food substances from water they have an aquatic environment where they stay and they strain out food substances well this one is actually a bit of uh, a confusing one why because this is the whale the shark is a is, is a strain um filter feeder also the whale really so i don't really know which um the, uh, probably sorry which um of that they would have probably wanted us to, because they both are strain uh sorry sorry they are both um straining food out of the water so filter feeder could actually be um whale or um shark this is a bit um for me they are both correct sincerely but well i actually put that diagram there for you to see that that's how that's um a shark trying to it's actually a shark yes it is so shark or whale is correct but i think i might if i'm not examination i'm going to pick one i'll well, just pick shark which is the first one there all right now which of the following is a feature of the population pyramid of a developing country okay a developing country well long lifespan low birth rates low death rates short lifespan well a developing country should have uh, a low um, death rate all right so which of the following is a feature yeah it's gonna be low death rate so people don't die much so they can keep increasing all right so it's gonna be low death rate all right okay now the interaction of organisms with its abiotic environment constitutes ecosystem when an organism is interacting with its um or interaction of community sorry not an organism community of organisms with their um abiotic environment temperature air water and all of those is going to be considered an ecosystem then 27 or 28 now the vector of the malaria parasite is well i think I, we had this one of the years now uh it's going to be female anopheles i already explained why to you it is only female that gets pregnant with egg and it needs to suck blood to incubate their eggs so the answer to that is going to be um b female anopheles mosquito and you have that here so this is your anopheles but not just all the anopheles the female one all right which of the following instrument is used to measure relative humidity well hydrometer is used in the laboratory and some other experiments to check for density relative density of some uh, like density of um, fluid then thermometer for temperature the answer to this question is hygrometer which is d to check for relative humidity what's relative humidity amount of amount of moisture in the atmosphere how wet or how dry the atmosphere is that is what we call relative humidity and you test that by using hygrometer and the moment is actually used to calculate this speed at which the wind is blowing so this is your hygrometer here and this is your anemometer which is used so how fast this is turning around is how fast the wind is blowing so this is anemometer to check wind speed wind speed all right then um maybe you have seen the ones that have arrows like that those are called uh, wind vane to know the direction of the wind but anemometer is for wind speed all right now exo erythrocytic phase when we say exo outside erythrocytic means outside red blood cell phase of the um life cycle of malaria parasite or cause in what is going to be in the um liver cells of humans so maybe the liver cells of humans it's actually in the liver cells of humans 
all right so here there you are so when it is done in um, invading when it's done with the liver they move on into the what red blood cells to reproduce there all right so basically the answer is going to be if you have seen i think i explained the life cycle in one of other videos talking about it is uh, going to be a sexual reproduction in the body of the humans and it's going to be sexual reproduction in the body of um, mosquitoes which is the vector all right now habitats are generally classified in two well students get confused with these and start saying all sort of the answer is b aquatic and terrestrial some book will go ahead to say aquatic terrestrial and arboreal arboreal means on the tree or in the air well the truth i would say is well trees are actually on the land so terrestrial still makes sense so it means terrestrial has already covered arboreal now when you say microhabitat or macro it's just size we just really talk about location really so it's just size so d is not correct because it's just size it's small habitat large habitats doesn't talk about where it's found so it is b now moving on draconculus can be contracted through what well that is um uh, draconculus is um ring warm so to say and um, it causes some sort of terrible inflammation like we've seen here so how can this draconculus medinensis which is a ringworm how does it get into people's body? It gets there when people take their bath in contaminated water. So if you look here, I would advise you to pause the video and study this. This is very interesting. I would have loved to actually explain it, but I wouldn't do that. It's going to take our time, really. So when this person you can see what was happened here, the person actually gets it while drinking water. That's terrible. Or you get the, the it by uh, the level from while you're actually in the water, they actually actually grow into someone's skin so well it can actually well it doesn't have a cure really what you do is you put some things here to make the worm come out then you start some um, that's the adult form you start bringing it out there that way all right so it's just read this particular part it's going to really help you out all right so the answer is it's beaten in contaminated water uh okay okay but i will want i will pick this one really well it seems to both of them made sense but i think i will just work with that one drink out of the water bathing out of the water but most time it happens in climate water because some of even get to drink the water once they just they stay in there this guy will just go into their feet as the case may be or it could just be one of the which of the following groups of organisms of environmental factors are density dependent now you have um, it means how many of these factors can actually affect how organisms do in an environment how well they do or how well they don't do and that's going to be food how much is available how much are they dying predation or predator killing them disease and accumulation of metabolites so the answer is going to be c to that question that's the answer to that question c is the answer all right so it says here millet sorghum maize and onions are common crops growth in nigeria in nigeria in the okay millet sorghum well those these ones are grown in um most um those kind of crops prefer the, the types of sudan savanna so to say really so the answer to this is going to be B, all right, B. So I changed my pen for the moment. So just let's work with this for the moment, please. Now, okay, moving on. Um, in which of the following biomes in south western part of is south um, south western part of Nigeria located? Well, looking at this closely. Uh, you're going to know now we need to probably look at this okay mountain or mountain is found here you can see that we have the mangrove which is this ones around this water side here we have the fresh water which is there in the poor court and some other parts like that then we have um 
the rainforest, which is where we are actually meant to answer. This is the rainforest, the green party. Can I just stop and pause the video here? But let me say something as you move from here towards this end, the rainfall, as you move from here like this, the rainfall um, reduces. So as I'm moving from the southwest to the northern parts like that, the rain, sorry, the 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 rain reduces while um, heat or temperature increases really. So the the um, southern west part is found actually is 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 made up of the tropical rainforest, tropical rainforest, which is this green part I highlighted or I marked out earlier on. The inheritable character that are determined by a gene located on the X chromosome. X chromosome, well, you remember that we have X and X as sex chromosome in males, or sorry, in females, while we have the X and Y as the sex chromosome in male. So this is a female, this is a male. So the answer to this is going to be, this is sex linked B. All right, sex-linked chromosomes, sex-linked diseases, so to say, sex-linked diseases. Okay. Then it says lack of space in the population could lead to an increase in uh, disease rates. Yes. How? Because some diseases are actually spread by contacts, by air, through the air and all of that. So when there is um, low space, yes, that's what during um, some this is also break. People actually quarantined. They actually kept isolated. They are, they are separated so that they don't spread to others. So once the space is too small and mass are choked, there's likely going to be easy spread of diseases as it were. Now, if the if the cross of a red flower plant with a white flower plant produce a pink flowered plant, now. What that means is the allele for redness did not fully express itself phenotypically, and the allele for whiteness did not express itself phenotypically. That means that this is called incomplete dominance. So they produce a pink flower. The truth is, you can't represent this, you can't know this by just crossing. It can't be shown in genetic crossing. If I was going to do R, R against R like this, this is a white flower, this is a red flower. All I'm going to have is going to be this, this in four places like that. Well, what you will think from the normal thing we know is going to be like red because this is going to be dominant. Uh, like it's going to be red dominant over the small r. Well, well, in this case, it doesn't always work that way. So in this case of incomplete dominance, you can't represent it. It's going to also, look, this is how the genotype will look like anyways. But you can't say it, you can't see it theoretically. All right. So the answer is incomplete dominance, in case whereby the two alleles, which is the big R and the small R, were not fully expressed. It just forms an entirely different organism character, which is neither of the two. All right. So in which of the following theories was considered by Darwin? Sorry, which of the following theories was not considered by Darwin in his evolutionary theory, variations of the fetus tissues and issues? Well, it's going to be decision and issues that was done by Jean Lamarck. It was Jean Lamarck that actually pro proposed all uh, the theory of use and issues. Jean, okay, so we call it Jean. I think it's a French man, so it's meant to be Jean Lamarck. That's G, sorry, J E A N Lamarck, like that. Sorry, I'm actually changed my, my pen. The other pen is. Um, is behaving that's why I'm using this one for the moment, please. But I believe you can spell that for yourself. So moving on, the crossing of individuals of the same species with different genetic material, the same species, please, is going to be called inbreeding. Let me use this pen here. Excuse me. Now it's called inbreeding. Why is it called inbreeding? Because you're using the same species, all right? That's why it's called inbreeding. 
for crossbreeding is like you're using different species, really. Yeah. All right. So moving on. The number of alleles controlling blood group in humans are how many? Now, well, let me quickly remind you of this in a minute. Now, you remember that um, blood group, you have blood group A. You have blood group A. B. A, B, and O. So, of course, you can see A, B, and O. So, these are three alleles, really, because this one is actually just repetition. So, we have three. So, the alleles there. So, this is an example of what we call multiple alleles in humor. Multiple alleles in humans. All right. So, that's what, that's an example of multiple alleles in humans. And that is controlling the blood group in humans, so to say. Now, during blood transfusion, agglutination may occur as a result of the following rea of the reaction between contrasting antigen and antibody. If this were to be a red blood cell, on the surface you have something called antigen, and inside you have something called antibody, or in the plasma, as the case may be. So let's say if a, if a, if it's blood, this blood group A is having, they don't have antigen A outside, and they don't have antibody B inside. Now, if this, what happens is during blood transfusion, you shouldn't give somebody that also has antigen, antibody A in this antibody, because this antigen will look for this antibody. If they match, which they do, is going to cause agglutination. But if you probably give the blood to someone that has, let's say, antibody B, so if it comes, they are still match, they are not both. A and A or B and B, they can actually receive the blood. So this is going to cause agglutination. So the answer is contrasting antigens and, um, sorry, that's a contrasting similar antigens and antibody. This, that's going to be D. Similar antigens and antibody will cause the agglutination. Similar, similar, please, similar. All right, that's why I just explained it out. Now, the fallacy in Lamarck's theory Lamas evolutionary theory was the assumption that the traits are acquired, traits acquired through disease and disease, acquired traits are inheritable, acquired traits are seldom formed. Well, the, the issue he had was he felt that, for example, now if I start gymming and I develop muscles, he believed that I can actually transfer that muscle, that trait of muscles I have. I wasn't born with it, so I actually formed it. So I acquired it by training. So you believe that you can actually transfer that to your offspring, which is wrong. That is a fallacy. So the answer here is, is B. It is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because it is only traits that are controlled by genes that you can actually transfer to the next generation. So that's why it is wrong. Moving on. The bright colored eye spots on the wings of moth of moth are to are an example of what warning coloration they actually use that to warn off it sounds it makes them look even looking at this now it makes it look somehow like this two eye spots so to say it makes them look somehow so it is a warning coloration really it's a warning correlation to make them feel dangerous to their predator all right Okay, the wings of a bat and those of a bird are examples of, that's going to be co co convergent evolution, All right? I already explained that to some things ago, like, means they have different ancestors because bat is a mammal anyways, and birds are apes. So when you have um, different um, structures, they have the same function because bats don't really have wings, really. What they have is a leg that is not made up of feather, really. What they have is like a skin, but it looks like a wing, but it's not really a wing, but they have the same function. So that's convergent evolution. So you might pause the video here to see the difference or the differences in um, what it has or uh, examples and all of that there. Now it says here, use the diagram above to answer this. Which of the following, which of the organisms represented are notable agricultural pests? Well, if I zoom that in, well, it's going to be, there are two of them there. This one is the grasshopper, that's the one. And this one is the 
caterpillar of um, butterfly. And in this larva form, it is very destructive to, uh, to, to plant it, to eat up the leaves and all that. So the answer is going to be one and four, which is B. That's B. That's B. Moving on. Oh, sorry. Then um, 47, it says here, let me zoom that. It says here that, um, use the diagram above. So well, what we need to remember here is when you see, oh, sucrose is here, 10% of sucrose and yeast, then lime water. Well, when you see yeast, you are looking at anaerobic respiration. And when you're looking at anaerobic respiration, carbon dioxide will be formed. CO2 will be formed. So the gas evolved here is going to be carbon dioxide. All right. Well, bear in mind, this aerobic respiration is during fermentation, which produces carbon dioxide and ethanol. And that carbon dioxide is going to be, going to be confirmed by lime water. So the lime water will turn milky. All right. Sorry, is that where okay, lime water is here, really? So this lime water will turn milky to confirm that CO2 has been released. You should know that from your chemistry. Now, but it's not every anaerobic respiration that you have carbon that has been released. It, like when you have aerobic anaerobic respiration in the muscle. Excuse me, please. What you have there is going to be lactic acid and CO2 will not be formed in the first place. So it's not always that CO2 is formed. All right, so but here, this fermentation and carbon dioxide is formed. Then um, the experimental setup above is used to demonstrate the process of, apparently, is gonna be fermentation, fermentation. Then 49, an economic importance of the organism represented in four, and was that, that's, um, the caterpillar, which is the larva form of butterfly, transmit waterborne, destruct, it is destructive to farm crops. That's B. Yes, it is destructive to farm crops, I said to why. And um, here we have our last question. It says, okay, the adult form of a vector is um of a vector sorry of three is a vector of sleepy sickness is the is done by uh first fly so the lava form is not this is the this this is the lava form of mosquito anyways the river blindness is transferred by black fly cholera is transferred by um uh, uh, uh by normal house fly then elephantiasis is transferred by a type of mosquito True, That is that Aedes. Yes, I think it's Aedes. But it's a type of mosquito, yes. And that is what causes, it's, uh, there's a filaria worm in, 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 in them. So that filaria worm is the pathogen. And the vector is this mosquito that causes elephantiasis, which makes people's leg to swell and all of that. Hope this has been helpful. I'm going to see you in the next one. Thank you for being with me. Do have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.